everything, only thing I'm scared is to lose ya. Yeah. I heard voices in my head, yeah, they whisper to us. Paranoid, smack, chamber, that's my room. Hola, hola, bon dia, buenos dies, good morning, bonjour a tu. Um, this is Sonar Plus D's second day, first day of Sonar. There is a whole festival starting out there. I'm really happy to see you. Estic contenta de veure-us a tots aquest matí en aquesta activitat que crec que és molt especial. We always talk about technology and how technology does things for us, but how can we use technology in emergency situations? And for this talk that is part of the program of the We Are Euro platform. We are seven European festivals. It's seven or it's eight, like? Eight. We are eight European festivals that we are collaborating in making program together, both music, but also talks and workshops and, I don't know, activities like this one that you are attending right now. So I'm not going to talk anymore, and I'm going to introduce you the participants of the talk today, which we have called Emergency Button, how technology can, use migration, can help migration. There is a huge crisis of the refugees in later years, but it's human to migrate and to go places and to have the freedom to go wherever we want to go and live our lives. But when people move, dangerous situations appear, and these guys over here, they have different experiences about moving from one side to the other. Well, first of all, filmmaker Mohamed Jabali. Yeah. Please. Yeah, thank you. Filmmaker Brigitte Sheffer. <laughs> Designer and researcher Efrain Foglia from Mobility Lab. Yeah. And Joanna Moll, artist and researcher. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is uh, Mohammed Jabali. I'm a Palestinian filmmaker from Gaza. Uh, I'm based now in the uh, northern part of Norway, uh, in Tromsø. And um, I'm a part of uh, a festival called Insomnia uh, Festival. It's electronic music festival, even that I'm a filmmaker, but I'm a member of this uh, festival, and I'm uh, glad to be uh, the host for you uh, this uh, afternoon or noonish. So, and uh, it's very important uh, topic that we are touching uh, now, and I think it's uh, it's it's one of the most important things that we are facing these days, and especially uh, after the crisis of, uh, we've been like, you're looking on um, the whole world and like uh, what's happening and what is going on. And I'm not gonna talk so much because I have my own story as well and that's why I'm a filmmaker and I want to tell the whole world what's going, what's happening around me and around um, the area. So we have today like three um, speakers from different uh, background mostly art and journalism, and, uh, and uh, through, through the, um, the session or the round table, we will be able to talk about this uh, technology and discuss that. And uh, as well, we will open the floor for you all if you have any question for, for my guest. Uh, and um, just feel free if you have uh, any question, they have like their like, experience in the field in different kind of way. And I would like to, to start with uh, uh, Efrain. He's he going to talk a little bit about his experience and uh, to tell more about what he uh, worked. Uh, OK, gracias. Thank you very much. Yeah, we, we just start with this claim from our work group. Uh, it's related, of course, with the current situation, what happened in Europe. Um, I will show some sparks, some examples of people or projects which are working in this area. After that, we will show a prototype concept we are working related with emergency situation. Well, this is headbunting. 
this is quite quite interesting artist from UK which is working several years ago in all these thing got issues. Ricardo Dominguez as well is a referent for a lot of people. He's a Chicano <laughs> Chicano boy which is working between the border, Mexico and the States. He's using the mobile technology to help migrants to pass the border to the States with and the FBI is really angry about it, you know? Also, there are a lot of projects working with drones. Drones was invented for army, but a lot of people is working, uh, trying to redirect the aim of the use of these kind of devices. Of course, if we go in history, the Zapatistas was a movement who really started using technology as a political framework, uh, specifically internet. We have also, this is really powerful example, as Patronas, a woman on the border between Guatemala and Mexico, and they really create a lot of communities to help immigrants. Uh, they really send uh, packs of food for all these people, which is really crossing Mexico to the United States, and they really find in this trip death, violence from the police, from the Mexican, from the people from the States, and it's really, really uh, also really um, interesting project which the people organize themselves to have all these things. Giphy.net is also a project which install open infrastructure in Sahara Desert to try to connect the refugee camps and uh, provide an uh, infrastructural uh, for the people. We also, we work in all these communities trying to show, making workshops, to create this kind of knowledge. And the important thing is that people can reproduce themselves this kind of infrastructures. This is Jordi, my partner in Mobility Lab, creating this Telesonic. We proved this two years ago in Delta, in South Catalonia. And it's a mixture, it's a hacking of telescope, but you see audio locative. And it's some kind of guy uh, to see the border or the political situation, and you can receive information and also be aware what happened in these political problematics. I will talk about the prototype we are working on. It's related with bots. Bots is, as this sentence say, is a new kind of species, species. It's a new organism which is really connecting with the techno-politics of the world, of course. We have the first human bot here, and the process of the last USA election shows the relevance to study this phenomenon. We create this concept, but or not, but for good. It's the same like at the drones. Drones, in the beginning, start just thinking and kill people, but a lot of people is working in the other way around. We are thinking it's time to hack boots and try to use for high people in this emerging situation. What is the first problem when we create a boot using in a Telegram group or WhatsApp boot? It's, it's that. It's the jump on the information or my interest to send information to Joanna but not to the other guy or in a group just for a few people but not to the police. We have all these really interruption, and we started to study that. Uh, we are working in, in Mexico City. The last year was a really earthquake, quite, quite hard. And one of the main problems was that, the communication between the different uh, group of the society. Because, for instance, the people don't trust in the police. If you want to send a message in Twitter, you want for a specific group, not just for all the people. Uh, this is a graphic quite interesting of Matrix project, which show the problem of this kind of communication. We have a lot of platforms, but everything are separated. This is the concept we are looking for, is try to make a bridge between platforms and really uh, create filters to improve the communication between these emergencies situation. Here is our architecture uh, design. We are working with Telegram and Twitter, we have uh, levels of alerts. 
and you have three ways to send information, text, location, and audio. At the same time, we are thinking in physical space. If I send a message to Jordi, we also want to affect the physical space. We call this situation sonification. Uh, for instance, we have here a boot um, in the festivals in Barcelona, but also in, in a lot of barrios, which are against the sexual harassment, and you can go to and tell your history. We can imagine use this kind of boot to send a sound alarm also to this kind of physical boots. We, make, we started to make a test. This is a street of Barcelona. We have the design. We will prove uh, 4 o'clock in one of these panels of Sonar Plus. We have uh, really designed already the boot. It's working more on this way. You get to a small computer installed in your balcony, and after that, you can send this audio message to FM frequencies, to audio speakers, or a lot of sound devices you can imagine. This is the small test. And this is our project we are really testing, first in Raval, with the problem of narcosalas, uh, drug dealer rooms, and I finish here my presentation. Uh, I believe it's every, uh, every single slide has a like, like very important topic, and you're touching that. And today at uh, 4.30, we have like, uh, like a workshop. Like, uh, so if you are interested more in the subject, you, um, you can follow up with this. And uh, to follow up. Um, follow up. Follow up. So, yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> So to follow up like uh, more and to continue our session, I would like to introduce uh, Joanna Moll. She's an artist and uh, researcher, and she has also some experience to tell. Yeah. Um, okay. So I've been researching in many other through all many other things uh, a lot on uh, Mex uh, surveillance of the U.S.-Mexico border executed from the internet. And this is a project that I won't be able to uh, explain it uh, uh, deeply. But this is a project that I released in 2016, which is sort of an interactive documentary that shows how the US crowdsourced uh, national security yeah, through social media and by gamification means. So the whole thing is quite twisted, and this project tries to explain this. So this project gathers a group of 300 uh, citizens from all over the world that uh, monitor the US-Mexico border from the internet, from their houses. Mm? Uh, in order to understand this a little bit better, I need to put you a little bit into context. So there was this platform that was called Blue Servo. Uh, it was launched by the Texas uh, governor in 2006. And basically, they just built up this online platform where you could monitor um, US, uh, sorry, Mexican uh, border crossings. I mean, not just Mexicans. Of course, it was like a lot of people coming from Central America from your home. So basically, uh, this platform empowered uh, people or regular citizens to fight border crime. Yeah, that was the main. Uh, the main idea. <coughs> this is the, the welcoming sign that you had when you uh, went into the website. Yeah. Then this is the website. It was shut down for many years. It was shut down in 2013, but last year it came back to life. And I whether, wonder whether this has something to do with Trump, because we'll see these sort of initiatives again uh, appearing, yeah? and, and very well funded, I imagine. So this was the site. There you had like several cameras you could watch over. Um, also, you had a lot of uh, archive videos that showed arrests uh, carried out thanks to uh, anonymous reports of these uh, volunteer users. Mm. And you had Amazon banners because the website was supposed to be uh, uh, sustainable financially, yeah, through advertising for the users that were monitoring the border. Yeah. So this was the original uh, interface. Now it's not available anymore. So here you, you had you could choose like between two different cameras, and basically you could just make a comment, ask a questions, or or make a report, yeah, straight away from your home. I was in Barcelona and I was monitoring the border, and I thought that this was very very perverse. And this actually looked like a video game. Like everything you saw something that was moving, it was just pushed to a 
to touch the to send the report through the red button all the time, and you were all excited. Yeah, there is something moving, right? Then you realize it was a cow, but you you reported it first. Yeah. So what was very very interesting about uh, this platform um, is that it wasn't really affected effective in terms of arresting people or stop border crime, but it was highly effective in terms of keeping a large number of citizens monitoring the border. Uh, and this is very interesting. Yeah, as you see here, like uh, the platform had more than 200,000 users, mm -hmm. uh, but it just made 5,000 interdictions in these uh, six years that it was uh, online. Six, well, here it, I put 2008. Uh, whereas the Department of Homeland Security, just in a single year, did more than 600,000 arrests. Yeah. So then I started to wonder, OK, why would people spend so much time monitoring the border? I mean, this is just ridiculous, right? Because on average, every user spend more than 10 minutes uh, per session, which is quite a lot. Mm. So then I started to dig in, and I found this um, Facebook group, which suddenly gathered all these anonymous users from the Blue Setbo platform, stopped being anonymous, and actually they were much more exposed to the people that they were watching over. Because in the cameras, you had no clue where people were either men, women, children, nationality, or whatsoever. But in Facebook, all these people, they really exposed themselves. Yeah. So this is uh, one of these examples. I, you, you could find these sort of conversations yeah, that were just arguing about different items that they thought, yeah, it's these swimmers. I ah, know, just a matrix of uh, you know, branches and so on. And this was constant. So I created this character. Uh, she's Marianne Smith. She's still on Facebook somewhere. Uh, to infiltrate this group and uh, try to understand the motives uh, behind these people, like what could push these people to monitor the border for free. Yeah? Because overall, like all these people that were monitoring the border, like you see on the previous slide, it was more than one million hours of free labor. Yeah, so we are talking about uh, sort of militarizing the civil society through gamification practices and free labor. Yeah? And this is quite something. Mm. So anyway, I had these sort of conversations. Uh, this was the first interaction I had with uh, one of the users who was like this uh, Facebook picture, yeah, all this beautiful family. Uh, and he was just monitoring the border. And yeah? we just had an argument here, what they were doing and so on. So the result of this, uh, the virtual watchers, the project, and I'm going to stop here, uh, it's basically the, my life as an infiltrated uh, border watcher. Yeah? And you can find just yeah, everything. It's all the archive of my three years as a sort of covered, yeah, um, extreme, <coughs> I don't know how I would put that. <laughs> well, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Joanna. And uh, we're going to talk more about like other things, what you're doing uh, these days and like current project you are working on. And to move to B Bridget, uh, Shefa, uh, I don't know what like, to say. She's a tough lady. She's a tough woman. Uh, she's been uh, traveling uh, across uh, 17 countries. Um, making, she's a filmmaker and journalist, and uh, yeah, I don't want to say more. You, I want you to, to, to tell the people who you are. And she speaks seven languages, including Arabic. So I'm so surprised. So if you have any question in any different language, you could ask her later. So <laughs> just yeah. Um, yeah, we're going to show a video of a program, a series I made for the BBC well, called Exodus: Our Journey to Europe. So. Just watch it a bit and then I'll tell you more about it.
دخل قطعنا ممنوع الحمد لله As soon as I got on the boat, I, uh, I switched my phone on, I switched the 3G on, and I immediately contacted my, my friend, one of my friends. Uh, I contacted my friend Hiba, she lives in the States, and on WhatsApp, and I was like, you just need to stay with me, because I don't know when we're going to go down, and as soon as we do, I'm going to send you my location on WhatsApp, and you'll call, the co call whoever you can call and tell them where we are. All right, so this is the program Exodus, uh, which was a three one-hour observation documentary series for BBC. And as you can see from these rather alarming scenes, we, um, of people crossing, this was from Turkey to Greece in this particular instance. Um, I've come to throw, as a senior producer of the series, my job is really to throw a bit of cold water on everyone and damp, you know, dampen, uh, give everyone a bit of a reality check on what it is to cover a story like the migrant issue. Um, so, for instance, our job, it is true, I did 17 trips to 11 countries in nine months. I was the senior field producer in charge of several crews. So I did Senegal, Gambia, Mali, Burkina Faso, Ghana, Burkina Faso, Niger, Libya, Italy. The other route I did was Syria, Turkey, Greece, Macedonia, Serbia, Hungary, Austria, uh, Germany, Sweden, and then um, I also obviously did Italy, and uh, it was basically some ended up in Europe and some in the UK. It was, it was uh, challenging at times. W what our job was really to, was to find people who were about to travel and uh, persuade them to become part of our program for no cost at all. And we issued them with smartphones to film their journey, especially the things that we couldn't film as a TV crew, um, because we might have either put their lives in danger by being there, or we, we also had to be very careful with our own legal compliance. We weren't allowed to do illegal border crossings ourselves. So they filmed parts of the trip that we couldn't do. And inside these smartphones, there were tracking devices because we wanted to monitor their, their trip, and not lose sight of them. This is fine until you hit a country that has poor uh, network service. So I'm, I'm going to definitely look up at this Wi-Fi net that you mentioned earlier. Because one of the big issues we face, particularly in West Africa, is that as soon as they hit Agadez uh, and the Sahara, we lost track of them. Um, so sometimes we don't know what happened to people, or they sold their phone for money, for cash, or they, it was stolen. So you'd have these situations where you were just hoping that they would get in touch with you one way or another. The thing about installing an emergency button, so we were discussing this earlier about, so, what happens when, for instance, in an occasion like this, their boat is sinking, their dinghy is sinking off the Turkish coast, and who do you call? In, in Hassan's particular case, he, he's a very switched-on bloke, and he has friends, and we were able, who called us, and we were able to call uh, the Greek Coast Guard and a local and a, a rescue ship and they went and found them and towed them, because the Turkish authorities won't rescue anyone. So we had to make sure they were towed into, Turk into Greek waters so that they could be rescued. That works fine in countries where you have uh, law enforcement or emergency services or charities, rescue operations, that are willing to go and rescue migrants, even though we've even seen in today's news how challenging that has become. But in countries where there are no, there's very little law enforcement or emergency services, like a country like Libya, uh, 
If you get a distress call at 3 a.m. from your guy, Mohammed, who's been trekking through the desert and just being detained by militia and being dragged off to a torture dungeon, there is really not much you can do. And it's a terrible responsibility as well for everyone to deal with this subject. Um, so the practical applications of installing emergency buttons are very complex because there is a moral and legal dynamic to, to it, which you, you don't really anticipate until you're in the situation. When you're dealing with it, from, like, from my point of view, where I'm, I'm, not a, uh, you know, I'm not fire service, I'm not police, I'm not rescue, I'm not a charity. I'm a filmmaker, I have a responsibility towards my employer, to my commissioner, to my team, my team safety, to the people I'm filming. And it's incredibly complex at times to translate what is a really good idea into a practical application. I will leave it at that. Yeah. So. Um, I mean, thank you so much, uh, Brigitte. I, I mean, it's really, really um, like important subject. And it's, uh, it's not a new, but what's a new in it, that's the technology we are in. And everything in surrounding us now is technology and how to use this technology to help us. And uh, I mean, this problem has been going on like since years and years and years. And as long as there is a human being, there will be like a problem with this. And uh, we are all refugees. But the, the concept of talk, like when you talk about like migrants and this, like I would say, the, um, there is so many um, uh, like description of this word by itself and how to define uh, like um, a tool where like it, it can help these uh, these people who's crossing, crossing borders it's not just about borders there is countries including in this like and it's uh, big countries and like still uh, there is no um, good way to uh, to find to, to use a tool to use to, to, to help these uh, people who are crossing the borders or to refer to th something they can use while they're crossing. And now we are, we are here to talk about this. And I know 40 minutes is not enough to talk about this subject. So I would start with uh, Bridget from where we ended. Like also tell a little bit about you've been in Libya as well and you've been following also like connected somehow some groups and if you tell, tell a little bit some of the experience you've been facing also when you contact the people and yeah. and how technology i mean can help help somehow or it maybe maybe they didn't help you yeah well libya is a country i know well i was the chief correspondent for bloomberg during the revolution and i ran the bureau out of tripoli for two years i speak fluent arabic and i have been returning to libya many times since so as the West Africa route generally passes through Libya, some go through Algeria and Tunis, but largely through Libya, I've spent a lot of time in the detention centers uh, on the coast. Uh, there's various points, congregation points, where migrants tend to use the boats from. These aren't pretty places at all. I mean, there's stuff that goes on there that some are better run than others, and I think the UN is making more of an effort to improve conditions. We had a particular problem where we had um, two boys from Ghana who traveled through, and I'd met them in each, I was like this pop-up person in their life, so I'd, you know, I'd see them in Burkina Faso and Ouagadougou, and then I saw them in Agadez, you know, and then I said, okay, fine, I will come and retrieve your footage, because that's the other thing, you know, we'd given them these phones, and that's what, you know, they don't upload this material, you have to go and f get the SIM card yourself. So I had to fly back to Libya and find them and get the SIM card off them, so, um, which I managed to do. They thankfully did not end up in a detention center. One of the other guys did, and that didn't go well at all. But we had a problem even just, uh, Libya is a country which uh, generally is very ill disposed towards Africans. They are deeply racist by nations. Um, sorry if anyone is Libyan here, and I'm offending them, but that is by and large the truth. And we had, and the smuggling operations are run by um, militias because this is a money-making money enterprise. Mm -hmm. Even simply filming them on the streets of Libya, just doing ordinary stuff like buying some food or walking down the road, 
got us drive-by shootings. I mean, we actually at one point, me and my security guy, um, got dragged out the car and shot. I mean, we had to kneel and we had an AK-47 shot over our heads. Thankfully, they didn't actually hit us. I mean, they could have. I think it was basically a big uh, get out of town gesture on their part. But it just highlighted how precarious the whole situation is. Uh, I mean, not, not just yeah. for us, but for them too. And, you know, and it's heartbreaking to then have to abandon them to it and say, well, I'll see you on the other side, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really complicated. Uh, just to move on as well, like, I mean, you come from Mexico and you know, like, how the whole, if you tell a little bit, like, some of your, ba uh, like, background experience and how you use, now you're, like, a designer and you're all, as well a researcher. So how, in, how do you work? Well, first of all, I have to say it's not really different the situation in the border, Mexico with the United States, like here in like South Gaza. Spain, yeah. you know? Yeah. All the time, other people ask me about Mexico, because yeah. if we take a bus, yeah. I got to South Spain, you know, we have a really, really a big, big problem as well. And in fact, Mexico is really famous for this border, you know? For me, uh, some places like Tijuana, for instance, is a kind of lab of the globalization, you know? It's next to California. In California, is the innovation, you know, and the workers are you know, down, but the same price, everything. Mm -hmm. And I think we are, we understand what we are living in a war. The war is really against the women, against the poor people, against the kids. And every time in every space we move, we can see that, even in the centers of the city. For this reason, I don't, I don't focus on you know, my origin. I focus on every city when I, when I see in this situation. And in a border like Mexico and United States, for me, is the result of the globalization system. It's mean, in the border, you can see really, really tough situation, but everything is connected with the economy in Europe or in the States or in Asia or etc. And in this case, it's, it's really, really a structural problem. And I think our labor is trying to be, you know, this kind of group of people who really hack these uh, technologies to really try to make a compensation of the design of, this, of those technologies. It's mean use this kind of tools to really replicate and really try to make a symmetry of these forces. Yeah. And to, to, to move to, you, to Joanna, you are I've been also working in uh, uh, environment, uh, environmental issues with data, so uh, with data and like how, like, and you are a, an artist as well and a researcher. And like how, how like you use your, how like, how do you use like these tools like to, to help you and the technology in general to to help you in your work and it's just of, if also if you could tell a little a little bit about what you are working these days on and uh. um, these days I'm I'm working uh, I've been researching a lot on the envir environmental impact of data uh, which is massive also in the environmental impact of all the uh, chain of production of uh, devices which is also massive there is a research um, project that was published last year in December, which stated that the, the device industry is the most polluting in the world already, much more than the meat industry, transportation industry, uh, and aviation industry. In 2008, uh, the emissions derived from the internet were higher than the aviation industry, which is massive. And this is just 10 years ago. Now it's much more, uh, I mean, the, the, this, uh, the amount of data that we produce uh, has a uh, rise in a whopping pace, it's, it's insane. And it's something that is not embedded in the social imaginations, that the fact that when we are tweeting, when we are sending a WhatsApp, when sending an email, or we just connect our devices to Wi-Fi, is uh, generating massive amounts of uh, CO2, yeah? pollution, and all the sort of uh, all sort of um, other environmental effects which are quite critical. 
So I'm working towards that now, and also I've been working a lot lately. I'm, I'm going to release a project in this month, in a few weeks, which I call Data Slavery, which uh, talks a lot about how data is being traded across several different parties uh, without the owners of this data uh, not being aware of what this data is doing for them, yeah? which profits has been done for third parties. Mm, which with the GDPR and so on, people is much more aware of what's happening, but it's been happening since the beginning of the days. Uh, so yeah, that's what I'm doing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I will, <coughs> uh, in, f in one minute, I will, <coughs> sorry, uh, to open the floor for you if you have like um, any question you would like to ask, and uh, uh, if, you have, if we have an extra microphone, we'll be like uh, going around. Or you can just shout. <laughs> or you can <laughs> just uh, shout. Like we have w two, you uh, one and two. Three. Yeah. Maybe he was first. A she. Uh, okay. And then. The and there's some guys up there okay. in the corner as well. No, no, she, she, she. Uh, okay. Um, hi, I have a question for Joanna. Um, I'm interested in like your findings to do with the surveillance project of the Mexican border. Um, when you infiltrated the Facebook group, um, what was the main motivation that was coming out of these people that were just, you know, policing this footage in their spare time? And what, what um, was the gender split and, you know, the nationalities of the people? Nah, that's a great question because I, I didn't have time to mention it. Actually, it was quite perverse because most of the people that were monitoring the border in this specific Facebook group, they were either retired, unemployed, or sick and they couldn't move from home. A lot of people even claim that they wouldn't know what they would do with their time without this, uh, this platform, you know, that it was a way for them to socialize. <laughs> Which is really perverse. And uh, nationalities, according to Blue Servo, they had connections from more than 190 countries. There's even this story that there was this bar in Australia that had a 24 hours feet of the border through these Blue Servo cameras just to entertain their clients. Yeah, so it was quite massive. And did you notice like a gender split? Was there, was it predominantly male or? Uh, it was quite 50-50, but it, uh, more, women were more active actually, which is funny, yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, Thank you. Uh, there's one there. Let's move. Uh, mine's for, for Efrain. So you said uh, you're, this is like a structural issue, and when you're walking different places, you see it replicated. Have you found any specific uh, solutions that can be applied in this different context, uh, such as Mexico or south of Spain or uh, Turkey? Okay, uh, this is one of the main issues. In fact, I, I show a diagram with different levels of emergency because we thought the, the best way is design a framework, you know? This framework really combine the main emergency system, and after that, the people can really uh, redesign for their specific problem. Uh, for instance, um, it's not the same work in the streets in the Raval here in downtown Barcelona than in the border, but if we create something like a frame, general framework uh, using, of course, open software, publishing everything, the people can really take, you know, and redesign for their own uh, solution. We, in fact, with Jordi, we are working in, in five different problematics. Surely we, we can find 100, but we, we start with five with di in different contexts. After that, the people can really replicate and really, um, you know, fit it in their own problematic. It's, it's, the, the issue is open up the technology and also the recommendation and cooperation. After that, I think other people can really create their own situation, this, uh, solution. Do we have um, another question? Uh, yeah. From you. Hi. Hi. I have two questions, but they are like, I think, quick. Uh, one is for Efrain. You were talking about, uh, like, yes. As the guy mentioned, working outside from Mexico. Uh, I'm from Colombia, and now I'm trying to figure out a project for, uh, working with people from Europe 
to finding solutions for, because it's really different the perspective that you find when you go out from your country. So for me, I want to know like some of your tips in your process of uh, helping the people to design their own solution and not being like so, I don't know the term in English, like colonialist or? Paternalist. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Exactly. And for Brigitte, my question is, how is to deal with the political and legal issues when you are trying to help these people? Because in Colombia, for example, and I know that also happens in Mexico, it's really difficult when you want to go for funds or to go for support from government because they they do the, the opposite. Absolutely. Yeah. Afraid? Yeah, well, this is, this is one important thing. In fact, we work in the, this prototype uh, focuses on Mexico and Barcelona. And I have 50% of my time of life in Mexico, and you know, I am half 50 years ago living in Barcelona, and my partner is from Mataro. And we have a lot of relationship with these both sides. But of course, when we go out from these scenarios, we need necessarily look for local communities. You know, this is really important. In fact, two years ago, uh, came some proposal for work in Africa, and I say no because I did not have experience, and we move or recommend people is working there. This is really, really important. In fact, this is the backbone of the solutions. Thank you. Uh, Brigitte, in short, please. Well, yeah, I mean, that's a big. Uh, it, it, that is a very big question, actually, um, and not one that I can answer really comprehensively. Yes, it is complex, also because as as uh, as managing teams and being from a filmmaking side, I have to enforce legal compliance on my team as well. And if you are in situations that are illegal, then yes, it is very very difficult. Um, it's. You know, there is support out there. Thankfully, there are many charities uh, that do very good work and NGOs and institutions as well that uh, you can involve in solving somebody's problem. Uh, also, for you know, in terms of impartiality, sometimes you have to step away from the, the problem. That doesn't mean that you don't care. It just means you've, you have to find a different way to deal with it. Um, and there are ways, uh, you can ask me about them later, but uh, it is a very complex issue, yes, it is. Uh, just to sum up, because I'm afraid that we are soon out of time, just if you would like to add something after um, Joanna, if you want to say something um, in short. Uh. About, <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, yeah, um, no, I'm not sure now. I'm sorry. Okay, any of you, if you want to say something, just say. Uh, yeah. Well, it's really funny to talk about these topics in this paradox yeah. I mean festival, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting at some point. And that's why it's very important, like, I mean, it's like to, to face these issues and to talk about it. And uh, we are stuck in this cloud of internet and with all this data and the information and the images and how to deal with this, all of this concept to be able to create something. I don't know, maybe it will call, uh, be called like the emergency button or something else, but that's why we are here, to talk about this and to open this discussion. And that's why it's great to be in this panel and with Sonar to be able to, to, uh, to work and do more and develop and... Uh, yeah, I'd just like to say a big thank you really to Antonia yeah. and her team for the great work and, and for actually hosting this panel and bringing us all together here today. Thank you very much. And also I will add that at 4.30 there is a workshop. Also it will be at We Are Europe Pavilion. So you're welcome to join yeah. and discuss also other issues. And uh, yeah, I mean, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much uh, for you. the talk. And life is beautiful. And we, if you see us, just talk to us. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.